Hello, hello, and welcome or welcome back to my channel. So in today's video, we are going to be talking about eras. And I know eras are something that we talk about, it seems like, all the time on the channel, but today I want to talk about the concept of eras themselves. I also want to talk about how it seems like our concept of eras, or maybe even our tendency to want to call every album cycle an era has changed over time. So of course, to make my point, we're going to talk about several eras that artists have, or maybe even if it wasn't called an era then, something that we would refer to as an era now. But of course, unfortunately, this video cannot be a list, an examination of every musical era or every artist era to exist. But of course, we're going to get into some of them and we're going to get into eras overall. So let's go ahead and do that. Nowadays, it seems like when describing music, many have come to call every album of an artist an era, and it's often used as a synonym for an album cycle, and I'll admit that I'm even guilty of it. At times, it definitely makes sense to use because an era, as defined by the dictionary, is a long and distinct period of history with a particular feature or characteristic. Historically, eras have been marked by major technological advancements, changes in religious or political ideologies, or are even geological. Apparently, even musically, there is an album era, meaning the time period when physical albums were the dominant form of music consumption, which lasted from the mid-60s to the mid-2000s. But because there is no set time an era must last or specific degree of change that makes something count as an era, not every commonly agreed upon era is a universally agreed upon one. Tying it back into music and pop culture, you see the same thing. If you ask someone, for example, when Banger's era started, someone might say when Miley debuted her blonde pixie cut, that's what I said in my era's analyzed, but others might say it was when We Can't Stop, Banger's first single dropped. This is something that I believe can also change in retrospect. We're like, okay, now that we know an album, a tour, a new sound followed Miley's drastic haircut, we know now that that's where the first seeds for this era were likely planted. At the very least, an era, of course, usually centers around a new album or project. Other common markers of a musical era are an aesthetic change, like a new hairstyle or dressing in a way that reflects the mood of the upcoming project, maybe the birth or death of an alter ego or character, and many artists will debut a new font or writing style for their name in the album assets. Often, of course, there will also be some sort of tour, short film, or promotion cycle to support the album. Because it's hazy, I couldn't find exactly when we started calling albums and album cycles eras, but I know it hasn't been common or prevalent my whole life. It feels relatively recent, like something that maybe started happening more in the last decade or so, but I'm not completely sure. I remember the term flop era being used even earlier, especially when everyone was dragging art pop online, so maybe that influenced our tendency to call each album an era. I tried using Google Trends to see if there was a peak to possibly indicate when people started using the word era to describe albums. But because it is a word used to describe many things, many time periods, it's pretty stable, with a small spike in the last couple of years that correlates with all the massive press surrounding the Eras tour. If you filter it to arts and entertainment, you get a few spikes every three years or so, with it leveling off in around 2017, and honestly, I'm not sure what those are about. I searched for the more specific phrase, album era, which I do admit is less used, and you get the most searches for the phrase around 2010, which I honestly didn't expect. But in short, based on Google search results, it is hard to narrow down when this really became a thing. That being said, if you think about older pop icons who have several albums and have gone through several sonic or aesthetic changes that we would now call eras, that's not really how they were written about at the time. Almost any comprehensive article on an artist's eras comes from the 2020s, some are from like 2018, 2019 also. Looking through contemporary articles about releases from artists like Madonna, Michael Jackson, or Mariah Carey, for example, I rarely found the word era used when I made all the search results prior to 2010, a point before flop era was a big part of the lexicon, but also late enough for these artists to have several projects under their belt. There were almost no mentions of these artists kicking off a new era, their previous eras, anything like that with that exact phrasing. And if I could find it, it would only be like once or twice or a couple times using that exact terminology, despite there being a heap of press surrounding that new album. And mostly it was used in fan forums or personal blogs, though not exclusively. More often, the change was referred to as a new look or sound, a reinvention, or an evolution if they're looking at a lot of albums together. For example, in 2005 interview just after Hung Up came out, Madonna referred to her own 22-year career at that point as an evolution and just spoke about the albums distinctly by name. For Madonna, the only era album cycle synonymous references I could find were from the 2006 Pulse music thread titled Madonna The Confessions Tour Era, obviously referring to her touring for the album Confessions on a Dance Floor. In 2009, Rolling Stone published a fashion-related interview with Madonna, and the interviewer asked her, which Madonna fashion era do you look back on with the most disdain? And if you're curious, Madonna answered the 80s in general, saying the 80s were a bad hairstyle era. 
And she especially hated a look where she says she was wearing fluorescent purple lipstick and a bright green sweater. Now I was curious if an artist was asked that same question today, would they respond more specifically with an album name to indicate the time period rather than a decade or even some years, since now we think of the era and album as more hand in hand. I also found both of those results on the second page of Google, so I really had to hunt. On the first page of Google, though, I found a 2006 WebMD article referring to Madonna trying to maintain her youthful looks from her Material Girl era. So not in direct reference to an album, because technically this would be like a virgin era, but a reference to a cultural moment marked by the popularity of one of the album's singles. I did later find a more recent post claiming Madonna's fans have been calling her album's eras for about 20 years now, which would check out with a little I could find. Next, I looked at Mariah because she's not only got a lot of albums, but also a few that seem like clear periods of reinvention or reclamation. I could find several articles that nodded to this, like referring to her getting her groove back during emancipation or finally being more artistically free around the release of Rainbow. That being said, again, very rarely do you see these albums being contemporaneously referred to as eras. I did find a pretty disparaging New York Post article from 2005, which mainly was about emancipation, but it referred to glitter as an era claiming. Carrie, who just turned 35, doesn't say it, but she also hopes to be emancipated from the twisted wreckage of her disastrous glitter era. Artists make mistakes and the public and industry forgets and forgives, usually. So only about four years after glitter came out, but still clear that this was a more retrospective thing. Artists like Michael Jackson, Elton John, and Britney Spears have something in common when it comes to these eras. While you don't see many pre-2010 references to their albums as being eras, I found none for Michael, one for Elton calling 1969's Empty Sky an era, and one for Britney in 2008 calling Circus an era. Despite this, you can find several articles from the early and mid-2000s that refer to their work as era-defining, some saying Britney ushered in a new teen pop era, or saying when his pop was topping the charts, Michael Jackson represented an era of musical consensus. I found like four articles all saying Elton John was one of the most successful artists of the rock era, referring to a time when the genre as a whole was at its peak. But when you take all the time or year filters off, you can find heaps of recent articles from just about any pop artist who's got at least a few albums talking about their eras. So the reference isn't technically new, but this phrasing is definitely more prevalent now. I think another clear element to this is that the artists I use as examples, even others I didn't use, they come from a different era of pop where for generations it wasn't the norm or expectation for artists to reinvent themselves at a breakneck pace, nor was it held against them if they didn't. To this point, I was looking through a Reddit thread hoping I could find people way older than me offering their perspective on these artists' eras and how they were viewed at the time. Several said they didn't see albums be referred to as eras until the 2000s on pop forums, with one person calling it a distinctly post-2015 thing. Referring to the Beatles, some noted that their eras are often marked not by albums, but by sonic changes. It seems like everyone's got their own distinct breakdowns of the Beatles eras, but one that I saw pretty commonly for them was that they have four distinct eras, rock, folk, psychedelia, and then a return to their rock roots. It also seems to be popular belief the group only had two eras, one of these breakdowns being pre and post 1965's Rubber Soul as their music starts taking on a more experimental and eventually psychedelic sound and they get more creative control. Then another common breakdown of their two eras is there's a red era and a blue era named for two of their compilation albums. The Red album contains their releases from 1962 to 1966, so albums spanning from Please Please Me to Revolver. And the Blue album contains releases from 1967 to 1970 and spans from Sgt. Pepper's to Let It Be. Not just with the Beatles, but in general, several of these artists would wait at least a few albums before revamping their look or their sound. I would think likely because it took longer in general to catch on with people, so you really had to reinforce your look, your sound, and do a bunch of appearances and shoots for it to really stick. I would also think there was less of a demand for a complete 180, even a 90 degree turn with an artist's next release because music, news, life in general just didn't move that quickly. Maybe it wasn't even an intentional progression on a lot of these artist parts, but one that just happened with time as their interests changed or as the musical trends around them did. That being said though, I think we discussed this before in Unpopular Opinions, but I think you can also notice less of a distinction between albums with several contemporary artists to the point where they could be thought of as in the same era, but is typically more prominent earlier in their discography. This makes sense because when artists are starting out, they similarly have to establish themselves and find their footing. There are quite a few recent pop debuts and sophomore projects or EPs that I would lump together, not necessarily consider them two distinct eras. Not to say the sophomore project or the follow-up EP was bad or regurgitation of that debut album, 
because artistic growth can still be evident even if the artist doesn't put out two radically different projects. For example, I wouldn't consider Rihanna's Music of the Sun or Girl Like Me to be two different eras, with the shift really coming around Good Girl Gone Bad, even that album title implies that this is a major shift. And of course, it was supported by an edgier haircut and an overall darker image than the pretty island girl next door image that Rihanna debuted with. I'm kind of of the opinion that Fearless and Speak Now, which are Taylor's second and third albums, could also be thought of as the same era, but maybe my memory of them is kind of hazy. But looking at Red, which followed Speak Now, you can see and hear a bigger shift, I feel, between those albums than between Speak Now and Fearless. I saw some people say that they feel the same, whereas others find the writing on Speak Now to be a bit more mature and narrative-driven, and this makes these albums two distinct eras. I did see a Reddit post where someone said based on the albums themselves, they would consider Fearless and Speak Now to be different, but stylistically, looking at Taylor's hair and her just fashion choices during this time period, they could see how people could consider them as one era. I think this is a pretty obvious one since they were marketed kind of as sister albums and have matching titles, but Folklore and Evermore also seem like the same era, which I've seen some people online just call Folkmore. Not even just with those two albums, but many others I've mentioned, there isn't too much of a stylistic change, likely because the albums came out so close together, often only around a year apart. Even looking at non-companion projects like Rihanna's first two albums, those came less than a year apart, so it makes sense there wasn't time for this big musical jump or this big jump fashion-wise. A more recent example of this is potentially Ariana Sweetener and Thank You Next, which are her fourth and fifth albums, and those were released less than six months apart. I can see both arguments for this one. Sweetener is a bit more lighthearted, but definitely still deals with themes of grief and sadness, but overall was meant to be a happier era for Ariana or a step in that direction. But months between, events like the passing of her ex, Mac Miller, and her breakup from Pete Davidson inspired Ariana to go in a more somber, reflective direction for the most part with Thank You Next, even if the music doesn't always echo the tone of the lyrics. Musically, that trap pop production is very present in both albums, and even later projects, obviously. And thematically, some of the same relationships and events are explored. But you could point to stylistic differences like Ariana's change in hair color in the two albums, the contrast between light and sweetener, and the darkness in Thank You Next that makes the albums more visually distinct. Though, in the video for Breathe In, Sweetener's final single, Ariana already has that caramel brown hair she wore for most of Thank You Next, which kind of signifies how close these albums were to each other. So I'm interested to hear what y'all think of this one because I think some people see Sweetener and Thank You Next as the same era, while others see them as sister albums from two closely related but still different eras. So I've established that even if they weren't called eras, most prominent pop artists, artists in general probably, people can divide their discography into distinct groups or periods, even if people have different standards for what those are. We could even probably take it all the way back to classical music, for example, and find something similar. So why does it seem like there's so much era fatigue? Or some people are like, if I hear the word era again, I'm going to lose it. One, I think it's because it's become one of those words that's inescapable online because it's used both seriously and sarcastically. Outside of albums, we talk about ourselves being in our flop eras and our healing eras, our single eras, our insert era here era. So we're already seeing the word a lot and maybe even hearing it often in real life too. On top of that, like I mentioned at the beginning of the video, it seems now that we call every new release an era just about. So in turn, you're going to come across the word more frequently. I see this the most in pop artists, which is why I'm focusing on them, but I think it's also present in pop adjacent artists like Nicki Minaj or Doja Cat, for example. They're rappers, but I've definitely seen people say that they have musical eras identifiable by changes in look and sound, and I would agree with that. With culture moving as quickly as it does, this kind of makes sense because albums don't have the lasting power that they used to, which is also the reason they seem to be promoted for a shorter amount of time. It's rare now to see an artist get a few years out of an album or even promote a single for a full year because people will be like, okay, boring, we've seen it, next. Additionally, if only one album makes up an era, the artist is better able to move on from that era if they choose and adapt to musical trends, which many pop artists often depend on because of that commercial element. Honestly, one album being an era can make complete sense if it's actually a cultural moment that lasts for a while and is promoted for a while, rather than a couple singles and then radio silence for a month or two after the album's release. Future Nostalgia is an obvious recent example, which lasted about three years from the first single to the end of the tour. Aside from Dua giving us a new sound and new hair, we got a deluxe album, a live show during lockdown, and even a remix album. This era is a good example of one that's framed around a concept rather than... This era is a good example of one that's framed around a concept rather than an emotion or arguably even a genre. 
The concept itself of the future nostalgia era isn't necessarily disco, but blending past musical sensibilities with those of the present and disco being a genre old enough to make that concept work, aside from it lending itself very well to pop, was the genre used to convey the future nostalgia concept. If Dua went on to release another disco album right after Future Nostalgia, even if they were sonically, they may not have been linked conceptually or thematically, arguably making them a new era. But then again, like what some people think with the Beatles eras, maybe you could just make the argument she was overall in a disco era rather than the Future Nostalgia era itself if things had played out this way. So it truly depends on what metrics you're using to mark the era, which can change from artist to artist or even consumer to consumer. Dua seems to be taking the approach that each era of hers lasts an album cycle. She stays in that era for around two to three years and then moves on to the next era. And so far, she seems committed to changing her hairstyle, her fashion, and name font with each album to separate those eras. There's also a recognition of eras that aren't led by an album because the era had no album. Rather, it was a string of singles that didn't culminate in a project, which we call droplet eras. I'm not quite sure when the term started, but I do think a pretty famous example of a droplet era is Selena Gomez's from 2017, with Bad Liar, Wolves, and Fetish, which seemed united based on their font and some of the videos referencing other singles. The singles were thought to belong to a scrapped album called Seven Hells, so now it's a very fun, like, oh, what could have been had the album come out? Apparently, these singles, along with It Ain't Me and Back to You, are available on a Target-exclusive version of Rare, which is Selena's 2020 album and the international version. In 2019, Katy Perry released a string of singles, 365, Never Really Over, Small Talk, Harley's in Hawaii, and Never Worn White, in between her two albums, Witness and Smile. Harley's in Hawaii was the only single to make it onto Smile, so the rest are considered part of her droplet era. With the exception of 365, these singles are united by a very 60s flowery vibe, so it's possible she was going to take that direction with Smile maybe, and then the singles are scrapped when she went for the clown aesthetic. Or maybe she just decided they wouldn't fit the album for other reasons. Droplet eras, I would think, almost have to be named that retrospectively because it has to be confirmed they never really amounted to an album. In addition, there's also got to be at least a handful of singles dropped over time for it to even count as an era or an unofficial era because it's not rare for an artist to drop a single or a collaboration or two between projects. We've talked about eras that are one album, two albums maybe, no albums, but of course an era could also last for multiple albums. The Weeknd, I would say, is an artist who's currently in an era that's lasting for multiple albums. This started with 2020's After Hours, and even before its release, he noted this album would sound different from 2016's Starboy. With After Hours, he would continue to move into pop, creating a dreamier, more synth-laden project than its predecessor. But still, a lot of his melancholy R&B sensibilities were present, because a new era doesn't necessarily mean you become a completely new artist. The Weeknd said the album is based around a character he uses to represent himself in this era having a really bad night. After Hours has a very Nightcrawler-esque atmosphere. It gives racing down highways in the dead of night, searching for a thrill, being overindulgent and living that superstar lifestyle, but teetering on the edge of ruin because of it. After Hours is the beginning of a trilogy of concept albums that examine fame and how on the outside artists can appear larger than life, but it can still be a pretty lonely, unfulfilled existence. We even see The Weeknd make a sort of parody of it with his changing facial prosthetics during this album. As he said, it represents how celebrities feel compelled to change and manipulate themselves for validation. You're likely also meant to think the overcorrection happened at all due to the injuries caused by his overindulgent and reckless lifestyle. This whole era is very heavily 80s inspired, especially musically, but After Hours seems to focus on the more enticing aesthetics, like the neon hues, the bright lights, and the big blocky padded suits showing power taking up space. Dawn FM, which came in 2022, continues this dreamy yet dark synthy sound, again meant to disguise all the miserable lyrics The Weeknd delivers, as he realizes perhaps his career in life isn't all that it's cracked up to be, or he worries he hasn't made the most of it. Metaphorically, he dies at the end of After Hours, so Dawn FM is being in that death, that limbo, and Dawn FM, the imaginary radio station that is the album, reflects on that experience. Visually, this album is still very dark, with much of the warmth sucked out from After Hours. But there's still this weird, eerie emptiness present in both, meant to represent loneliness, more so here because we're in a purgatory of sorts. Recently, a teaser dropped for the third and final album in this project called Afterlife, which we can assume might be a judgment of sorts, maybe a resurrection potentially, and probably also whatever The Weeknd's version of an afterlife is, maybe even in the sense of his own career and his journey there. I found this interesting quote about Dawn FM on Hearing Aid and I want to share it. There's a reason why the Weeknd fans call each album an era. 
Abel continuously reinvents himself and presents a versatility of sound that sets him apart from other artists. This points to how, again, definitions of eras aren't rigid and there can potentially be eras within an era. I'm not even sure what this era is called in its entirety, but personally, I consider it to be one era composed of three albums or installments rather than three mini eras making a big era, especially considering he called them chapters. And a singular chapter can't really stand on its own. It's got to be part of a bigger story. But maybe that's just semantics. Thinking of other artists who are working on multi-album eras, I think Beyonce's current album trilogy is another clear example. Renaissance is mostly house-based, Cowboy Carter is country-based, and it's pretty safe to assume the third album will focus on rock. Aside from being told that this is a three-part project, we can tell these albums make up an era together because despite differing in genre, each album focuses on honoring predecessors of that genre, many of them unsung, and highlighting contemporary artists in that genre, many of them also unsung, and then Beyonce tying her personal experiences and musical influences in with each album. So it seems like one of the things that unites them is having the same goal and having the same methodology. Aside from that, the end of Cowboy Carter seems to lead into Renaissance, though we know Renaissance ended up coming first. Both projects so far use similar fonts, and both album covers feature Beyonce and a horse that fits the genre of that album against a stark black background. I would potentially consider these albums to be ones that could count as eras on their own, and then also all three make one overarching era, united by taking a similar approach and having similar intentions with three separate genres. Then another example I talked about recently is Tinashe's project, which will be composed of three albums, Baby Angel, the recently released Quantum Baby, and the third album that's yet to come. The three albums explore Tinashe's sense of self, her relationships, and expectations. She said these albums represent a more personal side of her without any barriers or pretense, represented well, I think, by the cover of Baby Angel. Quantum Baby, which follows, of course, also sees Tinashe work through this journey of an unfulfilling relationship, ultimately deciding to choose herself and her career and focus there. And Tinashe has been clear that she sees all three albums together as an era, saying before Quantum Baby's release. I have more things coming in the whole era, which is really exciting. And I think you know part two is maybe coming in the spring. So who knows if it will become more of a thing with time as impactful artists continue to release these multi-album projects. Will our thoughts on what constitutes an era expand a little beyond one album equals one era, which is where it seems like we've arrived now. Not saying multi-album projects are new, just saying our need to mark every project as an era kind of is, and maybe that could change again with time. If it doesn't, though, I'm stuck on whether I think this is necessarily a bad or harmful thing or just another example of language changing. I think the people who are against calling every album an era might think it waters down the word or waters down bigger, more impactful, or more distinct eras. I think it can also be premature sometimes because we don't know how long an era will last and can probably have a better idea after a couple years or albums are moved from it. But on the other hand, that definition maybe isn't necessarily incorrect if all that technically is required for an era to be an era is that it's a long period of time that's distinct from another and the albums, whether they're bad or good, groundbreaking or not, they're often that distinction. And yeah, in the grand scheme of things, a year or two is not a long period of time, but in context of album promotion cycles right now, it kind of is, or standard at the very least. One I wanted to end on, which is an era that we're still in the middle of, is Guts. I think maybe with time, if it's not being said now, I'm not sure, I think we might look back on Olivia Sour and Guts as two albums that are later considered to be part of the same era. This would fit the seeming trend that this tends to happen closer to an artist's debut while they're still establishing their artistry, their sound, and their name. Looking at the two albums, which came out a little over two years apart, it seems like we have a similar color palette, similar themes of teenage angst that obviously move a bit into young adult angst when we get into guts. There's a lot of pop punk inspiration, emotional ballads, ruminations on navigating things like fame, friendships, and heartbreak at an early age. I do think guts has a wider scope than sour though, which is mostly framed around a breakup. Style-wise, there's not much of a full-on change in Olivia's look, but I would say more of a progression. She's aged it up a tad and seems to be sitting in those darker reds, purples, and blues compared to Sour, but they're still very much present, which I think reflects her approaching Guts with a little bit more maturity, even more candor than was present on Sour, which is saying something because she's a couple years older. And who knows, I could end up being wrong, but I would think in five, 10 years, whatever direction Olivia takes, even if it's not like a, oh my gosh, she did a 180 and a hyper pop and now has a blonde bob. It doesn't have to be that stark. It'll be a more distinct progression than her two albums now, which I think is logical for any artist because change is natural as time goes on. But again, I think this also speaks to how if you don't consider one album to always be one era, it can be easier to make these groupings in retrospect because you have more material to look at and synthesize.
As always, do be sure to let us know your thoughts and your feelings on eras. I think what I'm most curious to hear about is, are you someone who tends to consider one album cycle to be one era? Like I said, I do it too. But then maybe at a glance, I'm like, okay, maybe not every album is an era. So that being said, let me know if there are other examples of albums of an artist that you might consider to be in the same era, or you can let me know your thoughts on the ones I mentioned in the video. If you have one, I would be so intrigued to know what your favorite all-time musical era of an artist is. And it can be one from decades ago because like we were talking about quite a few of these reinventions these pop artists have gone through we would definitely consider to be an era even if that wasn't what a lot of people called it or if that wasn't how it was marketed back in the day also i have so many questions also going off of that i would also want to know how you personally categorize eras is it typically by genre is it typically more aesthetic thematic or does it tend to vary from artist to artist depend on maybe how they themselves interpret their eras and then last question is there a pop artist that you think doesn't have any eras? Because I don't necessarily think every artist, every pop artist is consumed with making sure their work is expressed in different eras or distinct periods. Honestly, the first person who came to mind for me was Ed Sheeran. I feel like he takes a very much like, if it ain't broke, don't fix it approach to his music, which I think has served him well. Y'all know I love Ed Sheeran. And I also feel like it's pretty fair to say the same thing about him looks wise. Like you don't really think of Ed Sheeran and think of big reinventions musically or aesthetically in his career. And I'm thinking back to the We Need a Main Pop Boy video that I did, where a lot of people in the comments made the point is that we don't tend to expect male pop stars to reinvent themselves sonically, aesthetically, as much or at all as we expect from the pop girls. I mean, some people do because they just want a new era with every artist. But yes, much to talk about regarding eras, many more examples, many more opinions than I could probably give. And honestly, coming out of this, I'm just like, okay, so an era has a very hazy definition, but I don't necessarily think that that's bad that we can categorize something as subjective as art in a very flexible way. But at the same time, I think our need to, especially preemptively nowadays, comes from this desire to want to be able to label something, categorize something very easily. But yeah, maybe at the end of the day, the real eras are the friends we made along the way. With that being said, all thoughts, comments, opinions down below, so that way we can chat like we always do. Also, really not important, but yeah, we're not gonna rock with this forever. Some changes are gonna be made soon. I just, I can't film in front of a stark white background. I just can't do it. But yeah, era comments, era thoughts down below. As always, thank you so much for watching. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe so that you can stick around for more. And if you'd like to become a channel member and get early access to videos, the link is in the description. Again, thank you so much for watching. I love you all so very much, and we'll see you so very soon. Bye-bye.